welcome to Local Foods College. I'm Linda Kingery, and I work with the regional partnership in the Northwest region. So we'll just uh, we'll begin at the beginning, folks. Uh, my name is Wayne Martin. I'm with Extension Livestock Production, and I'm based on the St. Paul campus, but uh, travel around the state doing workshops on um, not only poultry, but also work on sheep and goats and uh, pigs on occasion. And uh, we'll probably start doing some on beef in the not too distant future. Um, but mainly these days, there's uh, been quite a focus on poultry because it is a topic of great interest for a lot of people. And especially with the community that I work with, which is people who are beginning in agriculture, beginning in livestock production, uh, maybe have purchased a small farm and uh, want to get out on the land and raise something, but just to, in the process of learning how to do so. So this uh, workshop tonight will last, uh, I'm hopefully going to run about 40 to 45 minutes on speaking, and then we'll have some time maybe for a few questions. And certainly as we go through this, if you have questions, uh, feel free to type them in and we'll uh, try to get them answered as best we can. And if I don't have an answer this evening, um, I won't claim to be a complete expert on or an expert on poultry, but I will tell you that I'll try to get you an answer if I can't uh, answer the question. Um, and I will say apologize also right off the bat because um, this, this presentation, this slideshow is really long. It has a lot of information in it, way more than can be covered in just 40 minutes or 45 minutes. Uh, it's really about a two or three hour uh, presentation, but what, regardless, we'll go through it as quickly as we can, trying to answer questions along the way, and then it will be yours to look at. And as you can see, I have uh, on this opening sheet here listed my um, email address, and so I encourage any of you, if you have questions regarding the uh, information presented, don't hesitate to, to get back to me on it. I'd love to hear from you. So, so anyway, this is kind of the agenda we'll run through in the next 40 minutes, 45 minutes, looking at overall goals, some, a handful of poultry terms, selecting birds, uh, and then getting started, and nutrition, and housing, and pests, and more resources. And I will say right off the bat that um, Parts of this slideshow are a mix from a friend of ours in the past, um, an extension educator by the name of Jim Stornall, who was a great fellow from up in the Bemidji area, and he just passed away a week ago at a very young age. And so um, just um, a moment of thought and thanks to Jim for leaving us uh, this good information, and I added to it as I uh, progressed over time with the, uh, the using the slides, but many of the basic ones in here are from Jim's work in the past, so he continues onward. Um, so anyway, you know, all of us think about why raise poultry. I mean, who uh, who wants to do poultry and why? Uh, it's something that, uh, in particular for urban people, uh, we gave it up uh, after World War II for a whole variety of reasons, and it was just easier to buy meat and eggs at the store. But now a lot of people have interest in raising birds in their backyard, and so um, just to know where their food comes from, to create projects for their kids, or to even have their kids you know, really get into it, get into 4-H, uh, people are doing a lot of gardening, and so they want the fertilizer. And then finally, um, pastured uh, poultry is becoming a, a bigger enterprise as well. People are developing um, on-farm, small-scale commercial operations. So um, anyway, there's just a lot of interest in poultry production of all sorts. And uh, regarding the urban trend, uh, urban poultry trend, it really is one because um, in 2013, there was a study done, a survey of all households in uh, uh, 
um, Denver, Los Angeles, Miami, and New York City, and they found that almost 1% of all the people owned chickens. And actually, when you think about that number of households in an urban setting, yeah, that's quite phenomenal. Uh, more people were planning to get birds as well, 2% in New York City, and almost 7.5% were planning to get birds over the next few years. Um, as you might expect, <clears throat> Homeowners with one acre or more of land would be um, more likely to do so than others. And, uh, but just in general, uh, people were favorable about having birds, uh, you know, in the neighborhood, having their neighbors home. Four out of 10 respondents were in favor of allowing chickens in their communities. So if you're thinking about chickens in the urban setting, of course, right off the bat, you need to check with um, what's probably called animal control or something like that. It's, you know, a uh, department within city government. And certainly in, in the metro area here in Minneapolis and St. Paul, if you're going to have birds, um, you have to contact city and animal control and get a permit. And then they come out and inspect your property. and uh, they tell you, you know, you apply to have X number of birds. Um, Minneapolis is more flexible in the amount of birds you can have. I think St. Paul only allows four, no matter what. But you um, ultimately have to build a property that is, uh, you have to build a, a, a hut for the birds that is acceptable to the city and attend a class on how to raise birds. And then they'll give you a permit to do so. Um, and intriguingly enough, Tom, one of our uh, participants tonight, lives in a uh, community where the, um, it is not incorporated into a city, and so the, um, the township is making the decision about who can have birds, how many, when and where. One issue, there, there are a number of issues that people are concerned with about having birds uh, in an urban area. And uh, one, of course, is noise. Most cities' ordinances don't allow roosters because roosters do crow in the morning, but they can also crow at any time during the day and in the middle of the night if they're disturbed. Um, a hen will make noise when she's laying eggs. She will squawk and carry on for about five minutes, but uh, it's not so terribly loud. Um, there was a study done in Pleasanton California, and they found that um, a hen squawking uh, from just two feet away, the, it was a level of 63 decibels, which when you compare that to a dog barking, that exceeds 100 decibels. And um, unfortunately, I live in a neighborhood full of barking dogs, and they are loud. I would much rather have my neighbors uh, get rid of the dogs and invest in chickens. It would be much more pleasant. So some terms, um, a chick is a baby chick, whereas a poult is a baby turkey. And of course, a tom is an adult male. And if any of you have thought about um, guinea fowl, a keet is a baby guinea fowl. Cockerel is a male rooster, a male chicken under uh, one year of age, and a rooster is an adult male. When you go to order chickens, you can get a straight run, which is a, a mixture of males and females, or you can get uh, all cockerels or all pullets. A pullet is a young female, whereas the hen is an adult. And uh, two terms which sound similar but are quite different. Um, a brooder is merely a heat source for getting young chicks started, whereas um, a going broody is the maternal instinct in a female that causes her to, to want to sit on a batch of eggs and hatch them. And so during that time, she would quit laying. So broody versus brooder. Um, and there are so many uh, different breeds of chickens. This is just a, a small sampling of how many exotic birds are out there and the beautiful birds. And so when you think about getting birds for your backyard or your, your particular setting, whatever it is, 
the question will be, you know, what is the purpose of what we're doing here? And if you're doing it just as a hobby and not concerned about making money at it, then of course the exotic birds um, could be really interesting um, and a lot of fun to have around. If you are considering this as a, a commercial enterprise, then you need to be more uh, practical in your considerations and go for birds that offer some, some level of efficiency in producing eggs, producing meat, and helping you make money at what you want to do. So we'll go into the section on breeds, and I'm just going to run through these, you know, very quickly, but essentially there are different categories, basic groups of breeds. So you have layers, and their specialty is egg production, obviously, whereas the meat producers, the meat birds, um, are for meat. Dual purpose are birds that go back a long way um, in history prior to the modern era, and they produced both meat and eggs. Um, not as much meat as a meat bird, and modern meat bird, and not as much many eggs as a modern uh, egg layer. But nonetheless, they provided a lot of meat and eggs both, and often were quite hardy birds so that they could live in a harsher environment and do well and still produce. And then you have the ornamental category, which are, you know, like some of the birds you just saw on the previous slide, uh, birds that are uh, beautiful, uh, exotic, and need a lot of care and may not give you much of a supply of eggs or, or meat, either one. And then bantams um, are typically smaller versions of most of the main breeds, and then some are just uh, bantam breeds all their, on their own. They're not copies of the, um, the bigger birds. And they typically are about one-fourth the size of a, uh, a regular breed. So a bantam might be only about two pounds compared to a six-pound live weight of, a, of another bigger bird. Um, for laying breeds, uh, the breed tends to dictate uh, the eggshell color although there is enough uh, impurity in all the breeds that that isn't always the case. Um, some eight times uh, you'll be surprised by the color of eggs you get. But certainly one, one breed that produces white eggs on a regular basis are Leghorns. And um, they, are the, they are the standard for the modern commercial industry. They've been bred to cross with Cornish birds and they produce a lot of eggs. And then the brown eggs come from birds like the buff Orp orpington or the golden comet. The green Easter eggs come from a bird from Chile, the oricanas. Uh, regardless of the color, um, eggs, uh, the egg nutrition is really determined by the hen's diet, not just the color. People see brown eggs and think that they're automatically um, you know, more desirable, well, they are more desirable for the, uh, from the marketing point of view, but they don't necessarily have more nutrition. nutrition. It all depends on what the birds have been eating. Um, so brown egg layers like the Buff Orpington or uh, now the Golden Comet, um, they were traditionally more practical, especially for outdoor production. Uh, they were a meteor bird for future uh, soup, soup birds, whereas the modern commercial breeds are so tiny and um, they're just spent by the time they're done laying eggs. And there's really nothing on them to go into soup even. Um, but the the traditional birds were more docile and easy to care for. Uh, one complication with them, of course, is brown eggs are harder to candle to see if there are any defects in the, uh, in the egg, and slightly less production. But they are hardy animals, and uh, in particular, like the Buff Orpington, they're good for the Minnesota climate. Leghorns, as I just mentioned, they're the, they're, um, a bird that produces a white egg, and uh, um, they are kind of a high-stress bird. Um, they can also be aggressive. I, I'm on a, a blog, an online uh, group of people that talk about uh, 
in chicken production. And people have recently been commenting that their leghorns have been uh, really aggressive towards other birds. So if you're just beginning, um, this may not be a bird for you, but if you are uh, interested in a lot of egg production, this is a good one. The Buff Orpington, heavy dual purpose bird, um, with all that heavy feathering on it, why it's good for our cold temperatures. Um, they're good foragers, they get out and roam around. Um, they will go broody, which, uh, you know, if you, you have to gather eggs re regularly, they keep them from doing that, but they are good mothers if you want to have a, a chickens, chicks raised from them, in which case you would need a rooster. Plymouth Rock is another good breed. I'm going to go through these pretty quickly because there's so much more to cover. Um, Rhode Island Red is um, probably the best brown egg layer of the dual purpose breeds and they can handle marginal diets well and the even poor housing conditions. Not that you want to do that to a bird, but it just means that they are hardy. Uh, they will get out and forage and still produce eggs for you. But you do, of course, the best way to get good egg production and have a healthy healthy birds is to provide good housing and um, and good feed. Here's a exotic bird, the Polish. Uh, obviously uh, a beautiful bird. They'd be fun to have around. Um, they may not give you a lot of eggs, but nonetheless, they look fun and, and great to have in the front yard or the backyard. And then the Oracana, or it's also referred to as the Americana. It's the Easter egg chicken. It actually comes from the country of Chile. And the eggs are bluish green uh, to deep olive. Uh, this bird, the Australorp, is one that a lot of people are using in pasture production. It is uh, a good meaty bodied bird as well, and it also holds the record world's record for egg production. And the New Hampshire Red, a dual purpose bird. Sex link, that means that uh, the male and female are different colors at uh, birth, so it's easy at hatching, so it's easy to um, do the sort on them to, uh, to get all females in a batch or all males. Then the meat breeds. Uh, for those of you who are thinking about um, pastured poultry production, um, I would say that uh, um, the Cornish Cross is a bird that is very commonly used in uh, pastured production even though it is uh, not really a very good bird for that purpose, it does grow. It just grows so efficiently that it's hard to move away from it. Um, most, most meat breeds are crosses or they're a hybrid, uh, very fast growing almost to a fault. Um, these birds, this um, Cornish cross has been selected over the last oh, um, 70 or 80 years just with uh, breeding to grow so that it is twice as big in less time than its um, ancestor of just 60 or 70 years ago. It grows twice as big on less feed. Um, part of that growing, uh, fast growing, can lead to leg and heart problems. Um, that can be managed to some extent with feeding, but it is something that you have to be careful about. And I think no matter what, as they grow, um, you will have, you'll see the birds really start to have difficulty in walking because they just grow so big. They, they've been bred to develop, to grow a big breast because that's what the consumer has been told we should be eating is lean breast meat. And consequently, that's where the money is, and so that's what the industry moved moved toward, is growing a bird with a huge breast. So they're, as I say, because they have difficulty of walking and because they have just um, 
part of that ability to grow fast requires a uh, tremendous appetite. And so they grow, they're hungry all the time, just ravenously hungry. And they stay by the feed trough and eat, and they'll produce a five to six pound carcass in as little as six to eight weeks. A recent issue that has been developing is that the breast is now so big that they're having an issue called woody breast syndrome. And that means that it literally is so tough that um, it's hard for the consumer to eat. They may not notice it until it's cooked and then they try to cut it up and it's tough and dry and uh, tasteless. And actually, just yesterday, I had my first woody breast. I had um, purchased meat at a deli and um, brought it to the office and tried to cut it up and it was so tough that uh, I could barely chew it. And it was uh, breast meat from a standard industry bird. So the industry is actually talking about going towards a slower growth bird, such as possibly the Red Ranger, which is, uh, or also known as the Red Broiler. It's a bird that is active on pasture and um, a hunter, and it takes its slower growing. It doesn't have as big a breast. It has uh, more leg and thigh meat, but it takes 10 to 12 weeks to reach four to five pounds carcass weight. Um, so, and then it's good eating as well. So you can, um, you know, 10 to 12 weeks compared to six to eight, that's a, that's a lot of feed to end up with a bird that's not much bigger. So if you go with this kind of a bird, you really need to know that you've got a market for it and that you can make money with it. Uh, the reason people go with the Cornish Cross is it's just so efficient that it gives them the best chance of making money. But I would say that more and more people are going to these birds like this one, the Red Broiler, or the Freedom Ranger, which is, I have raised um, all three birds here on campus. I've raised the Cornish Cross and the Red Ranger, and the last two summers I've raised the Freedom Ranger. And they come out of a hatchery in uh, Pennsylvania, and the genetics was brought to this country from France where they had been used on pasture since the 1960s. Um, they're a slower growing bird, takes 10 to 12 weeks or even longer. Um, when I grow them here on campus, uh, we've spent right at 11 weeks, 77 to 78 days growing them. And when I had a mixed batch two summers ago, um, they averaged, that was a mix of male and female, they averaged about a five and a half pound carcass. Last summer we did all females and they just grow slower. So I had a four and a half pound carcass, but um, they are exquisite eating. They're loaded with fat and even on a barbecue grill, the breast meat stays moist, juicy and full of flavor. So, um, we want to keep raising them if we can. And we supply restaurants here on campus uh, with the birds, and they absolutely love these birds. So, um, and by the way, about a third of all the birds eaten in France are raised on pasture. People um, love that, the flavor that they get out of those, and, and uh, you know, that extra time spent growing. They, um, they like it and they pay more for it. They're willing to do that. But in this country, I would estimate that probably less than half of 1% of birds are raised on pasture. So when ordering chicks, uh, you would order chicks from a hatchery, like in, uh, there's a couple of big hatcheries in Iowa, Welp or Hoover, and they, they uh, Hoover, I know, produces about a, they sell about a half a million, or hatch about a half a million chicks a week. So you can order either a straight run, which is a mix of male and female, or all pullets, or all cockerels. The, the cockerels are a, just a bit more expensive, but they grow so much faster, it's worth it. You will get an extra pound of meat in the same amount of time um, as if you had 
just pull it. So I'd, I'd like to order, um, I'd like to order cockerels when we do raise birds here. I couldn't last summer because um, for the first time on campus, we had moved our chicken huts out near some apartment buildings and the roosters, as they matured, they begin to crow and we got complaints. So I had to go back to raising all females. Um, for broilers, because they grow so quickly, you certainly need to plan their arrival around their departure. Uh, you need to be thinking about what you're going to be doing with them. So have, have processing lined up and a market lined up all in advance. Pullet chicks will need about the same basic care initially, uh, but uh, they'll be staying around longer, so you need to have a plan for them as well. One, one vaccination I like to get on all birds when they, um, before they're shipped out of the hatchery is against coccidiosis. Coccidiosis is the major killer of birds, um, you know, in the first four weeks of life. It causes diarrhea and it can kill a lot of birds in a hurry. Uh, the vaccination is very inexpensive. And what they do is they, uh, they spray it on the birds as they go through a conveyor. And then the young birds explore their environment by pecking. And so they uh, peck at each other and ingest the, uh, the vaccine. And then it helps prevent getting uh, coccidiosis. I had a producer call me a couple of summers ago and they had lost, um, out of a thousand birds, they had lost 500 in four days. Uh, they were in three days and they were four weeks of age. And as it turned out, it was coccidiosis. And for about 15 cents a bird, they could have vaccinated them. So um, for me, I think it's worth it. You need to have a clean space, warm and draft free. Use wood shavings. I think those are really the best unless you have, uh, you know, straw, which unless you have a lot of cheap straw, then you can use straw, but you need to add to it on a regular basis. Um, sawdust is okay, but the birds can in inhale it, and so you don't necessarily want to use it unless you have a really cheap supply of it. Um, wood shavings seem to be the best, and they really, they've just come out of the hatchery at 90 to 95 degrees, and so they need that when they're first beginning, uh, the first week of life, and about for each week, for the first four weeks, you lower it about five degrees per week. The birds, um, after about four weeks of age, will be fully feathered or pretty close to it. And so uh, by then they can take, you know, a uh, certainly 70 degrees, no problem at all, or even 60. But if you, you know, it gets colder at night than say uh, 50 or 60, you would want to have extra heat for the birds even at four weeks of age. Or I like to just simply because I think, um, I think they benefit from it. Um, an incandescent bulb uh, will put out a lot of heat, and but it's good if you can buy an incandescent bulb with a red cover on it, because the bright light makes the birds very active and aggressive towards each other. Um, the red bulb, for whatever reason, the minute you uh, lower the intensity of light, the birds calm down. So. Um, so anyway, it is worthwhile to use a lower level of light, uh, or if you have heat bulbs, cover them with a red, with a red um, tint of some sort. Um, clean out the water uh, troughs that they're drinking from at least twice daily. Keep the water as clean. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, and they will drink a lot of water. So. For fast growing broilers, uh, you should limit the, and I'm talking in general Cornish cross, but I've done this with other breeds too and it still works, so it's just fine uh, in that regard. Um, limit feed after the first week. So essentially turn the lights out if you can or withdraw the feed from their uh, areas so that they can't eat during the night after the first week. For the, for the next three to four weeks, 
because if they have access to feed and the lights are on all night, they will eat and eat and eat and then develop what is called flip disease, which is a heart attack. And so as they approach market age, again, this being the fast growing broiler, they will, um, you'll go into the check on the birds and there will be one of the biggest birds flipped over on its back dead. And it is, has had a heart attack. And um, you will lose, you could lose uh, several, two or three or four out of a hundred to flip disease if you don't limit feed. Now, after you have, of course, taken them out of the barn where they were under heat lamps and um, moved them out onto a pasture setting if you decide to do that, then of course the daylight will end and darkness will set in and they'll stop eating. So then it is controlled during the last few weeks of their uh, time out on pasture. Um, clean bedding or add bedding regularly, especially around the waterers to avoid ammonia buildup. If you, this is where it's kind of one of those um, contradictions, but it really isn't. You need a draft free environment, but you need fresh air in there and you need clean fresh air. Um, if you can smell ammonia, then the birds are definitely getting a dose of ammonia because their lungs are more sensitive to it and their nose than we are. So, um, so keep the area around the uh, water is clean and dry and also add bedding as needed. If you smell, if you smell ammonia, why well, you need to, uh, you need to add bedding or clean it up. Uh, keep the area biosecure. That's becoming more important. You know, make sure that you're keeping uh, rodents out and wild birds if you can. Um, keep uh, neighbors out, especially if they're raising birds themselves. You don't necessarily want to pass disease back and forth between farmsteads. So it's just a good idea to, uh, or if you have visitors come in, have them step in a foot bath just to um, clean up their shoes a little bit, at least to help in that regard. Once the birds are out on the landscape, um, they will continue to eat even when they're stressed by heat. But when it gets above 85 degrees, you, and it's in particular if it's humid, you really should pull the feed until it cools off because you could lose birds to heat. They, they really struggle in, the, in hot weather. So I would not, um, you know, get out and feed them early in the morning if you know it's going to be hot and then take the feed away even by 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning, just so uh, during that hot part of the day, they're not gonna have a full stomach because they will, they will struggle. Um, Feed is your single greatest variable cost. Now, if you're, you know, this is if you're, um, if you're concerned about feed cost because you've got a commercial operation compared to if you're, uh, you know, raising chickens for a hobby and you're just enjoying your company. But nonetheless, I think it is regardless, it is good for everyone to think about how much things cost and what you're putting into getting egg production even in your backyard, even though you know it's going to be more expensive just to be thinking about what you're going to spend on it. So nutrient needs vary with age and stage of life. Um, chicks need higher protein than adults do uh, because they're growing, they're putting on meat, and meat birds need more protein and energy uh, than um, layers do. Layers need a lower protein diet with more calcium in it. They're, you want the layers to grow slower. Um, grit is needed to help digest whole grains. I wouldn't necessarily give them whole grains um, if you are into commercial production. If you are raising birds for fun, um, whole grains or treats that people call them, that's a good thing. They, they enjoy it, but that, um, Giving, giving birds that you're trying to make money off of whole grains does not help them uh, produce eggs. Uh, cold weather uh, increases nutrition requirements. 
I, th I think that, you know, even though we assume these birds are tough and they can take the environment, we need to remember that they are a warm-blooded creature. And so they, like us, have a temperature range, a thermal, neutral environment in which they are comfortable and not, not, um, not using energy to stay warm or to cool off. That thermal range for birds is about 50 degrees to 75. Above that, they burn energy to try to cool off by panting, for example, and um, below that, they're burning energy to try to stay cool. So you, once it gets below 50, you will need to increase their feed just a bit. So these are basic nutrient requirements of all animals. Um, protein, carbs, vitamins, minerals, etc. And I am going to, I see what time it is already, so I'm going to speed through these. Uh, birds, birds are omnivores. They love, uh, they do eat meat. They eat everything uh, that you can uh, imagine, but they still need a balanced feed ration because all of these creatures or whatever they may get off the landscape, that will only uh, give them uh, a portion of the actual nutrition they need. I think typically, probably you can expect about 5% of their nutritional needs um, that come from the landscape. You can buy pellets or crumbles or mash. Mash is the least expensive, but it can plug up a, um, a feeder it also, if it comes with different particle sizes, they'll pick and choose. They may not eat the soy meal. They will probably want to eat the corn and dig through it. So that's an issue. So I think I would um, start chicks on pellets or crumbles and then switch to mash later. Um, of course, it's, uh, there's different types according to the market you're serving, whether it's conventional or transitional or organic. Uh, you can get diets without um, soy, you can get diets without corn, or you can build them on your own. You may have to go to work with the, uh, the local feed mill to do that. You can also get feed with, uh, with without medication. And as mentioned earlier, uh, blended mash is probably the most economical way to go, uh, certainly in the finish stage. Um, one thing, of course, no chicken feed has added hormones in it. That's prohibited by federal law. Um, you know, when you go to the grocery store and you'll see on a label, it'll say no added hormones, and then there'll be a little asterisk by it. And then down at the bottom, it will say the U.S. government prohibits adding, um, you know, adding uh, hormones to the, to the feed diet. So typically for broilers, it's a two-stage diet going from 20 to 24 percent, then to, uh, in the, after the first four weeks going to 18 to 20 percent. And they'll consume about two pounds. If they're out on range running around, they may consume close to three pounds of feed per pound of gain. Um, and that's true for any of these. Even a Cornish cross will be less efficient out on the pasture than they would if they were in confinement because all the birds are moving around to some extent and burning up calories so they need more feed. For, <clears throat> for laying hens, if you start them out, you know, as chicks, there's either a three or a four phase diet. So you would start with a, a starter and then go to a grower, possibly a developer, but you wouldn't have to. You could go right to the layer diet. Um, and in about 20 weeks of age, you should be getting, um, you know, getting eggs shortly. So about 20 pounds or so of feed to produce a, a broiler or even a, a, a layer because they do grow somewhat slower and they just don't have the appetite that the, the broilers do. Housing uh, is limited by your imagination or whatever the city says you have to do. Um, Certainly, I've got slides on, so if you're, if you're an urban producer or thinking about raising chickens in the city, you'll have to talk to animal control because they will want something that looks nice, aesthetically pleasing in the city. 
So you will spend something more money on it than you would on a, um, you know, something that you would do in the countryside. And that's where you've got to talk with the local authorities, but they will have to approve what housing you build. Of course, out in the country, you have uh, more choice. Um, for housing, for inside a building, for birds, for layers, you would want three to five square feet. Uh, you don't need that for chicks or for broilers. Broilers uh, don't need um, a whole lot of space at all because they go to market so quickly. Uh, one key thing to remember is that um, hens are really affected by the hours of daylight. They need 14 hours minimum in order to produce eggs throughout the year. So in the summertime in Minnesota, they can do all right on their own, but coming into the winter season, even in the fall, you'll have to supplement um, you know, the light with, uh, with light in the hut in order for them to um, continue producing eggs at the same rate. Uh, typically, you know, the same kind of uh, you, a dust bath is optional, but it's a good thing to have. Um, they love to lay in the dust and spread out, and it actually is a way for them to help control lice and mites. And then they have bedding needs, straw or shavings, chopped up cobs, one nesting box for every four hens. So here is a photo of um, the birds we raised on campus. And you can see in this shot that we had Cornish cross birds. Um, we built these huts, most of them about five years ago. And we used to put, um, they're just cattle panels doubled over. These huts are eight by eight and they hold 30 to 35 birds. We used to put tarps on them, but now we have gone to vinyl siding just simply because it doesn't uh, wear out. It doesn't get torn off in a windstorm. And um, it, it's uh, more work up front and more expensive, but they've been on there now on some of them for five years. And we've had windstorms that have uh, picked these up and just turned them sideways. And, and we lost a bird or two, but not anything like what has happened in the past where we've had tarps that have been shredded and made a real mess. We have wheels on them, so we uh, pull them forward with the two-wheel dolly. And we have uh, feeders and waters that hang, from the, um, that hang from the ceiling inside, so everything just goes forward. And the birds learn to walk forward because they're hungry. We, uh, we move them before we feed them. Uh, so a few years ago, uh, we had uh, straight line winds one evening, 70 miles an hour. And this was when we had an older hut that was kind of poorly designed. And uh, they all got shredded, but luckily we ended up um, getting the birds back under heat and we saved almost all of them, except in the morning we came back and we found this one lone bird sitting on the uh, pile of rubbish. And that's when we went to rebuilding all the huts. Here's an example of what a farmer has done uh, with a bigger hut. He can hold two to 300 birds in this. And um, he moves it every, oh, two or three days with a um, tractor. He has somebody walk behind and shoo the birds forward. You can see, so this is Mark Fell from up near um, Carleton, in a, um, actually Renshaw, Minnesota. And he's been a uh, organic producer for a long, long time. And so you can see he's got uh, everything hanging from the ceiling. And it, we were there in August and it was a warm summer day, but the birds were doing all right. And anyway, you can see the manure track left behind. So this uh, turns into some really good crop ground for vegetables or corn or good pasture for the following year. So here's how I built the huts, the chicken huts. Just, uh, I started to build one out of um, PVC pipe, but it didn't work. It was, I was hoping it would be uh, lightweight and strong and it was neither one of those. So I quit and just built it out of cattle panels. And here's what it looked like originally. And of course we no longer use the vinyl tarps. 
Um, out of these two waterers, I prefer the one on the left. They're much easier to take apart and clean than the one on the right. The one on the right is a full bucket that sits inside that trough, and you have to take a take it apart in order to clean it. Um, so this one is much easier to work with. Um, I make feeders out of PVC pipe, and so right here they are. This is a two inch, and this is a three inch feeder, three inch in diameter. You buy PVC pipe 10 foot long and just cut out about a, a fourth of it, leaving the sides curving over so that, uh, let's see how you'll see that right here. See how it's curved in? That helps prevent splashing feed out. Uh, otherwise, birds can be really wasteful. And I just plug the ends with um, pieces of wood that I cut, and then we hang them from uh, the ceiling inside the huts. The PVC pipe is a good, cheap way to build um, a lot of feeders if you want to raise birds on a commercial basis. Or even if you just want to feed your birds, you know, really in a handy way and not have them waste feed. It's much harder for them to get it out of these. So predators, here on campus, uh, predators are a big deal. And we raise chickens in huts because if we didn't, we wouldn't have a bird left at the end of the summer, at the end of the, the batch of birds that are growing. <clears throat> we have hawks and raccoons and coyotes and foxes. The people in the apartment buildings told me that every evening about nine o'clock, coyotes would come up and walk all around the huts and uh, scare the birds. I think occasionally maybe one was, one bird was scared enough that it somehow crawled out from underneath and we would find feathers the next morning. But the biggest enemies, the biggest problems were ki um, hawks. They're just relentless. They harass the birds continuously and will occasionally get a bird scared enough that they crawl out from underneath and um, then they, Everybody likes chicken, so they uh, they eat them. And what we found too is um, with raccoons, we had our huts originally wrapped with um, chicken wire, but a, a raccoon could reach through with its paw and grab onto a bird and pull feathers out. They could damage the bird, but not uh, not significantly. But they couldn't get it out. But they would bother the bird. Hawks would reach through the chicken coop wire with their beak and grab onto a bird and they would tear off flesh and we would have to euthanize the bird. So we ended up uh, wrapping all of our huts with what's called hardware cloth. And you can get that at Menards or Home Depot. Um, hardware cloth is just a much thinner kind of um, fabric, it has a much smaller hole in it, and nothing can get through it. It uh, protects the birds really well. Uh, like I say, we do have foxes. They love chicken, just like uh, all other creatures. Hawks, I just mentioned, uh, we've got a video I'm going to put up of a hawk relentlessly hammering a uh, building, trying to get birds to come out of it. Skunks, of course, you can smell skunks once they've been there, and uh, they can come in and they'll eat a lot of eggs, and they will um, kill a lot of birds too. Coyotes love chicken, you know, and especially um, you know in the spring when they've got young ones to feed. Weasels, weasels can be a real problem because uh, this is a a much bigger. Um, this is a fisher in this photo, but. A weasel is a tiny little creature. And if you live near a stream, a creek, or a river, you may have to confront weasels. They um, they will go through a little tiny hole and they just are murderous. They will kill all the birds in there or a bunch of them. They don't eat. They just get uh, crazy and just kill everything. So they are a consideration. And then, of course, dogs. <laughs> One time, uh, one morning, we had um, 
people love to walk across campus here with their dogs and let them run free because there's all these big research plots out there. It's wide open. And somebody had a dog loose one day and it came by one of the huts just as uh, I had opened it and I'd taken the uh, waterers out to refill them. The wind blew the hut open and immediately a bird jumped out and the guy and the dog was right there and it grabbed the bird and killed it instantly. The owner was so apologetic. I told him not to worry about it. He came back a little bit later and gave me a check for $50 for the bird. So I thought, you know, he can uh, have as many birds as he wants. But nonetheless, uh, dogs are an issue. Um, health and disease, as I mentioned earlier, coccidiosis is a problem in young birds. Uh, they'll get diarrhea and often die. Uh, you can buy medicated feeds, which just simply have a coccidiostat in them uh, to get them started. You can try using apple cider vinegar in the water, one tablespoon per gallon, or you can try probiotics or yogurt. Uh, that may help as well, but ultimately you're better off either to use the coccidiostat or to use um, a vaccine. One thing you'll need to watch out for in all young birds is after about two weeks of being um, in the heated area under the brooder, um, they may have loose uh, fecal material on occasion and it's warm in there that dries up quickly. Literally, they're bent. They're uh, the opening where both um, fecal material and eggs come out that can be um, plastered up and they will die from that. So you'll have to wash the, you know, pick up a bird and very gently wash that off with warm water. And their skin is so sensitive, you have to be careful to not damage the bird in any way. But um, anyway, a lot of birds will get uh, plugged up with pasted vents, so it's something you have to watch for. And then, of course, avian influenza is an issue. Um, high path is different than low path. We commonly have low path avian influenza in bird flocks, and they suffer through it and maybe get better, or you lose a few birds. High path avian influenza is the one that went through in 20, uh, 2015 and killed millions of birds nationwide. So the best thing is to prevent. Use vaccines, um, provide a good, clean, and dry environment, good feed, fresh air, sunshine, worry about the predators. Uh, disease shouldn't be a real problem for you. Uh, you know, chicks at the hatcheries cost one to three dollars each. Feeders can be made, as I showed you, for, and I've got videos online to show how to make, um, how to make the huts that we make and how to make the PVC pipe feeders. Lane, I shared the link to the Small Farms YouTube on in the chat, so people should have access to that. All right, great. I'm almost done here, I think. Okay. Um, let's see, what else? Egg production, well, they'll begin laying at about 20 weeks of age and produce for about two years. Um, they will certainly de begin to decline by the end of the second year. Um, the big commercial processors only keep birds for one year, one laying season, and then get rid of them. It takes about uh, 25 hours to make an egg, so you won't get an egg a day, but you can get, you know, maybe five eggs a week from birds, and you don't need a rooster unless you want to hatch chicks. Um, the feed is different, as mentioned earlier, more minerals, more calcium in the diet. Um, you know, just go with the balanced feed that you buy at the store, feed store, that's the best thing to do. And uh, you can do mash. Again, the scratch grains or whole grains, those things, if you're in it for a commercial operation, you really want to stay with the balanced feed ration. So pick up the eggs regularly, or they could get dirty. 
the ones that are really dirty, you should not try to sell you sh or even use yourself. Um, you know, there is there are regulations about how to clean eggs if you're marketing eggs, and I hope that you're following them if you're already selling eggs. If not, there you go to Dairy and Food Inspections, and they have information there about that. And I can send you a link. Uh, let me know if you want that, and I can help you find that. There's a lot of information online about what you do to to, uh, to prepare eggs for for marketing. Keep things clean. You know, take the manure out, manure out, compost it, and get it ready for the garden. Processing birds. Um, if you uh, you can do some of the butchering on farm yourself and sell birds to, directly to people, or you can. Um, Get them processed at a uh, uh, processing plant, either USDA approved or state equal to or custom exempt. These all three serve slightly different markets, so you need to be thinking about that. Um, so anyway, getting started, you need to decide how you want to proceed. And by all means, look the information over that I'm giving you this evening. And then uh, don't hesitate to send an email, contact me or other people who are involved in chicken production. Uh, there's a lot of information out there. And talk to neighbors who are doing it. See how they get along. Um, and with that, I think we've got it. Here's just a whole uh, several uh, lists of resources. Um, here's a list of hatcheries that are in the upper Midwest. And good books, Poultry Your Way, uh, you can purchase that online, or Stories Guide to Raising Chickens, it's actually a free download. So is this one, the Poultry Your Way, you can download it as well. And with that, I am done, and it's mm -hmm. 7 o'clock. Well done, Wayne, you got through <laughs> a lot of material there. A lot, I and I apologize to people for that, and. Uh, but if, if people have questions, is the radio or time worthwhile? Um, that was also asked earlier. Someone asked, um, I would like to know if oregano works in water and how to put it in. Um, and I, I'm not aware of what. Um, well, there, there has been, um, uh, you know, some experimentation, some research done on time or oregano. Both, actually both, and in typically I think they're put in feed, and then what happens is um, the, um, it helps their gut. Kind of, it almost serves as an antimicrobial, mm -hmm. and so helps keep the gut clean. Uh, but there hasn't been a lot of work done on it, and um, so it's iffy at best at this point. It hasn't necessarily been replicated. But that's something that I actually want to pursue. We're trying to get funding to do that at this time. More on oregano and thyme. A couple of questions about chickens' behavior. Uh, one is, will chickens stay near the coop if they are released into the yard? And I um, to say a little bit more about well, why you use huts. <laughs> well, OK. I, I, you know, it also it depends on the breed. Um, if you have the broilers, the Cornish cross will stay where the feed is. They're just not going to roam very far. Other broilers, like the Red Ranger or the Freedom Ranger, those are a real pasture-type bird, and they would get out and roam. If we didn't, if we didn't have our birds in the huts, the Red Ranger or the Freedom Ranger, they would be everywhere. And um, the same is true of Layers. Layers will get out and explore the environment. So um, you have to make that decision as to how much you're willing to expose them to the elements and to predators uh, as to how far you want them to, to roam. Some people will, like in an urban backyard setting, they'll build a keep an area fenced off, making a run essentially to let the birds out of the building but kind of control how much space they have. Mm -hmm. In a pasture, the birds may go to the far end of it. But um, what you can try to do 
is round the birds up, especially when they're young, and get them to come back to the hut in the evening. Otherwise, they may roost in trees, and which is a great opportunity for an owl. Mm -hmm. There's also a question about, uh, are ticks a concern for pasture poultry? Oh, uh, not. They won't uh, necessarily cling to them or stay on them. They will, you know, and pastured birds will eat them. So, um, yeah, I think it's uh, not an issue. Any fowl will also eat them. But I, um, they won't, they won't necessarily uh, drain your birds of blood or anything like that. So ticks aren't, I don't think, typically not a concern. Mm -hmm. And someone asked about any suggestions for having chickens off-site, you know, uh, like away from your house maybe 10 minutes away. Do you, um, is, is there, when, when you have those huts at, uh, on campus, there's a lot more activity around there than there is maybe? On well, they're out, they're out, um, you know, on a research plot and they may be far away from, uh, you know, from really any other act, human activity going on. Mm -hmm. That which is why the, um, the hawks bombard them constantly and uh, try to scare birds out. So if you, the further away you have birds from the buildings, you know, the more they're going to be exposed to the elements and the predators. That's just a, a, just a fact. You have to accept that. So you might get through, you know, you might get through a season and not, not lose very many birds to predators. Then the next time around, you might get really hammered. It just, uh, it does vary. Yeah. And Chris, uh, Chris says, I use wild game feed for my chickens, both for broilers and layers. This is a small number of, mm -hmm. well, no, I guess not. earlier he said he has four, uh, youngest layers, four years old. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> And he adds oyster shells for the layers, puts flax in as well. Uh, they've done well, but is there something I should know about this? I'm trying to do, trying to be organic with no soy or corn. So what is he using for a protein source, I guess, I would ask. Um, I think some people use field peas. Uh, they do need, you know, layers don't need as much protein as broilers, but they do need some. You know, it's good to have about 16% uh, protein in the diet. Um, flax, I don't know that it will contribute much protein. Flax can be an issue in that if you have too much of it, it can put a fishy taste into the eggs. It does increase the omega-3 content in the eggs. So that's, and that can be measured. And, and if you're selling that eggs with that, um, you know, as a, with a say a marketing um, approach of yes, they're omega-3 enriched. Um, you probably need to prove that on a regular basis, but uh, and have them tested. But definitely, flax will increase omega-3. Too much flax can be can give a fishy taste to eggs or meat. Um, and trying to raise birds without soy. And corn can just be really tough because uh, they're so commonly used in the Midwest, throughout the U.S. But field peas, uh, wheat actually for energy uh, is as good as corn or better. So if you use field peas and wheat, that would be a good combination. But it would be a more expensive diet so you would have to take that into consideration as well. Mm -hmm. And Jake suggests you might want to give a quick update on the veterinary feed directive. Well, the, on the veterinary feed directive, so as of January 1st of 2017, uh, you can no longer buy um, or order feed to be made with antibiotics in it. 
other than I believe the coccidio speed with the coccidio stat is still available because that's not considered to be truly an antibiotic. Um, but you can't get, you can't go to your local feed store and ask them to make feed for you and include oromycin, for example, or you know, or a, a feed grade penicillin. You just can't do that, uh, or Thailand 200 in it. Um, now, the uh, uh, if you want feed with uh, an antibiotic in it, for whatever reason, uh, let's say your animals are sick, your birds are sick, you need to have a vet come and write a prescription. That's the only way you can do it. Mm -hmm. So well, thanks for uh, thanks for sticking around and answering questions. If, mm -hmm. if participants have more questions, uh, let's go back to your first slide. Wayne, so people can yep. uh, catch your uh, get your email there again. Yeah, way back. Way back, and you'll also uh, this will be available, right? This will be posted. Yes. We'll post the slides. We'll post the recording of the session, and uh, we can add the links that uh, the links that uh, Jake posted <laughs> into the. Uh, in that uh, chat as well. There. But there you've got Ma Wayne's email. Marty067 at umn.edu. So please um, don't hesitate to send me a question. We also have a listserv, um, UM Poultry, and it is um, at the Small Farms U website, Small Farms U Poultry. Uh, you can join the listserv there, and where there's announcements about events coming up related to poultry, uh, poultry workshops, um, and other, you know, news that's appropriate for the poultry poultry producers. Okay. Well, thank you again, Wayne. Uh, All right. You shared a lot of great information. <laughs> thank you, presenters. We've had a, a range of folks with little experience to a lot of experience and some, some creative and alternative options. Uh, hope you all enjoy raising, uh, raising some chickens. And uh, please do complete the evaluation when you see that email come to you. All right, and thanks. We will sign out. All right. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.